Okay, today we'll be starting our chapter on cells. What is a cell? So I'm sure that you knew that this chapter was coming if you've taken any life science classes. But cells are the basic units that make up every living thing. So just like atoms are the basic unit of matter, cells are the basic unit of living things. And scientist Robert Hooke was the first individual that named cells. He was the first one to see them and give that name. Because when he looked at cork under one of the first compound microscopes, the little boxes that he saw reminded him of monastery cells or rooms. And now we call the study of cells cytology. So this is what he saw in the cork that made him describe them as little cells. And this is a microscope that would have been similar to the one that he used. A compound microscope uses more than one lens. You will do this in this unit. You'll use a compound microscope and that helps to increase magnification. So what is the cell theory? Uh, after Hook made his discovery of cells, two German scientists built upon his uh, discoveries and his observations. The botanist Matthias Schleiden determined that all plants were made of cells. So he was a botanist, he was studying plants, and he determined that not only were there cells in cork, like Hook had found, but all plants were actually made of cells as well. And then a biologist by name of Theodore Schwann determined that all animals were made of cells. So he was studying animals. He determined that animals were made of cells. Schleiden determined that plants were made of cells. And eventually we determined that all living things were made of cells. But these were two of the first scientists to really um, make observations that led us to that. So a few years later, two Polish physicians carried the study of cells even further. Robert Remake studied the development of chicken embryos and tadpoles. So he was studying how organisms reproduced and developed. And then Rudolf Virchow looked at Remake's work and published it as his own. And so he gets a lot of the credit for Remake's work. But Virchow concluded that all cells come from the division of other cells. So these observations from these scientists led to the formation of three major principles, which we now call the cell theory in biology. Number one, the cell is the basic unit of all living things. We already talked about that. Two, cells perform all the functions of living things. So that means that there aren't just a couple of cells floating around in your body while the rest of your body is performing the functions. Um, in order to eat and uh, digest food and breathe and all of that. It is completely comprised of cells, and the cells are the actual units that are doing that work. And then three, cells come from the reproduction of existing cells. So cells are not just um, formed out of thin air. They come from other cells, and when those cells divide, um, additional cells are created. So how do prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells differ? All cells have DNA, which carries their genetic code. And we'll talk more about DNA later in the course. And they also have a cell membrane, which acts as a barrier between the cell and its environment. So this picture here is an amoeba which is microscopic. Uh, 
It has a very flexible cell membrane that allows it to extend in many directions. So the cell membrane is this boundary that is separating the inside of the cell from its environment. And then on the inside of the center portion of the amoeba is the DNA. That's the darker portion there. And there are two major types of cells. Eukaryotic cells, which have organelles bound by membranes, and each organelle performs a specific function in the cell. So this is a picture of a eukaryotic cell. And you can see each of these little packets um, in here are organelles. And they are wrapped around, uh, have a membrane wrapped around them. And that helps to contain all of the um, items, chemicals, structures on the inside of each of those organelles. And prokaryotic cells do not have membrane bound organelles. So here's an example of a prokaryotic cell. It has DNA and it has a couple of other organelles here, but it does not have any membrane bound organelles. So they're not wrapped in membranes. Plant and animal cells are examples of eukaryotic cells while bacteria are prokaryotic. So this is a picture of a prokaryotic cell. You can see it has a plasma membrane or cell membrane here, the green layer. It has a couple of other outer coverings. And this is an animal cell and that's eukaryotic. So the DNA of prokaryotic cells is circular. It's all packed up here, but it is circular and loosely packed. While eukaryotic cells have DNA that is tightly packed into a nucleus to protect it. So the nucleus is over here. We'll talk more about how DNA is packed in a eukaryotic cell as we get further into our course. A good way to remember these, by the way, is that eukaryotic cells do have membrane bound organelles and prokaryotic cells have no membrane bound organelles. So in summary, many scientists used experiments to create the three principles of the cell theory. Although all cells have DNA and cell membranes, some cells are prokaryotic and some are eukaryotic. Okay, so how does a cell store its genetic information? As we mentioned, most of the DNA of eukaryotic cells is housed in the nucleus. In this picture, that would be the blue structure here. And unless the cell is dividing, the DNA is wound around proteins in long strings called chromatin. You can see the long strings here, and we'll talk more about what happens to the DNA when the cell is dividing later. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear envelope. Remember we said these are membrane bound organelles, so there is a membrane around it. And it has small pores, so you can see the pores here and here, that let materials in and out. Inside the nucleus is the nucleolus and it is a smaller, dense portion of the nucleus that manufactures ribosomes. And we'll talk about ribosomes in a minute. The empty space in the cell is filled with a jelly-like substance called cytoplasm. So that would be this light blue part here. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells are filled with cytoplasm. So it's not just empty space inside the cell. So how does a cell make proteins? We've talked about what proteins are, but how does a cell make proteins? And there are three organelles involved in producing and distributing proteins. Ribosomes, which we just mentioned, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus. You can see where those are located in the cell right here. So ribosomes are very small. These are also found in prokaryotic cells. So very small ribosomes. 
The endoplasmic reticulum is much larger. And that goes, um, it is connected to the nucleus and the Golgi apparatus, which is a similar stacked shape on the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. So we'll talk about the functions of each of these organelles. First of all, ribosomes produce proteins from the DNA code. And we are gonna get into a lot of the nitty gritty details on how that happens later in the course. But for now, you should know that ribosomes are found in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, or prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Ribosomes can be found in two places within the eukaryotic cell. They can be freely floating in the cytoplasm, like these little gold ribosomes here, or they can be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, so we call those bound ribosomes. And kind of difficult to see on this picture, but they would be these dots here on the stack-like endoplasmic reticulum. And ribosomes frequently move between the two locations, so they don't just stay in one spot. They are sometimes freely floating, sometimes bound. The endoplasmic reticulum, which we call the ER for short, is attached to the nuclear envelope. So that membrane that's around the nucleus extends out into the endoplasmic reticulum. And there are two kinds of endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth ER, which contains enzymes for making lipids, which are fats, remember, and carbohydrates. And the rough ER, which has ribosomes attached to it. So those are those bound ribosomes attached to it, making it the rough ER, so that should be easy to remember. After the proteins are modified in the are made in the ribosomes, they are modified by the rough ER and transported in vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. So let's see what that looks like. So here's the nucleus of a cell. This is the nucleolus. These are the nuclear pores here and the membrane, and so you can see that that ER is extending right out of the nuclear membrane. This is the smooth ER that does not have ribosomes attached to it. This is the rough ER that has bound ribosomes on it. And the ER will ship proteins from here in little bubble-like structures called vesicles. And it ships those, kind of like a little envelope of proteins, to the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus then is going to modify those proteins some more. And we'll talk more about the rest of this process in a second. So in the Golgi apparatus, proteins are modified and shipped. So they are actually physically changed. Sometimes pieces are added to it, sometimes pieces are eliminated from the protein, so the, the chemical structure of the protein is actually changed in the Golgi apparatus. And then it ships the proteins to their final destination, either inside or outside of the cell, depending on where the final destination for that particular protein is. What is the function of that protein, and then therefore where does it belong? The Golgi apparatus is a flattened stack of cisternae. So fancy word that just means like a stack of um, discs of, um, you know, floppy pancake like kind of discs. Each cisterna is responsible for modifying or tagging the protein in a specific way so it reaches the correct destination. So as I just mentioned, these proteins are physically being changed by adding atoms and molecules to it. And so um, some of those are tags that help the protein get to the correct destination, either inside or outside of the cell, depending on whether its function is maybe in a different part of your body or if it's uh, functioning within that cell itself. So in summary, DNA is stored in the cell's nucleus. Its code is used to produce proteins in the ribosomes, which are then sorted by the endoplasmic reticulum and modified by the Golgi apparatus 
before reaching their final destination. Okay, so we've talked about how proteins are made in the cell, but how are substances stored in the cell? We are going through each of the organelles in categories here. So we've talked about protein forming organelles. Now we're going to talk about storage organelles. Vacuoles store water and nutrients for the cell. Animal cells have several small vacuoles and plant cells have one central vacuole. So you can see on this picture here, this is the vacuole, this large bubble-like structure here, and that is going to store nutrients and water, especially in a plant cell, plenty of water. The vacuole in plant cells makes the cells rigid, which allows the plants to stand upright. So as these rigid plant cells are stacked upon each other, the vacuole, because the vacuole is swelled with water, as those plant cells are stacked upon each other, it makes the plant, let's say the stem or the leaf of the plant, actually upright and makes it rigid. rigid. As you know, when a plant loses water, it wilts, and that's because these vacuoles are beginning to shrink, and so the cell itself is no longer rigid, and it starts to um, sort of fold in upon itself, and then the plant wilts. Some specialized animal cell vacuoles are able to pump water out of the cell. So usually the vacuoles are just used to store water, but some specialized animal cells can actually pump the water out. And we'll talk more about why they would need to do that. So how does a cell digest materials? So some of these organelles are for storage, some of them are for storage and recycling, basically. So just like a recycling bin in your house would store materials, but then eventually it's going to be changed into something else, uh, that's the same thing that's happening in these structures here. And those structures are called lysosomes. So they are small sacs of enzymes. Remember, enzymes are a certain type of protein that's able to form chemical reactions. So it's going to break down macromolecules that are being stored in there through chemical reactions. And lysosomes can break down old cell parts. They can recycle the monomers in them. So we've talked about macromolecules and how they're made of many different large molecules. And these lysosomes are able to break down some of those very large molecules and turn them back into smaller molecules that can then be recycled and reused in the cell. So that the cell isn't constantly needing to bring in new material, but it's able to recycle some of the old material when the cell parts get worn out. The lysosomes can also be used to digest large cells and particles engulfed by the cell. So there are some types of cells in your body, um, like some immune cells that are able to engulf and swallow up pieces of bacteria or viruses, uh, things that enter your body and need to be taken care of, gotten rid of. And so lysosomes are able to help do that as well. How are organelles supported within a cell? So we've talked about storage, now we're talking about support. Organelles do not float freely in the cell. So we mentioned that there is cytoplasm in the cell, but they're not even really floating around freely in that cytoplasm. There's a structure known as the cytoskeleton. Cyto, remember, meaning cell, cytoskeleton which provides internal support and helps to move materials around the cell like a conveyor belt. So this is what a cytoskeleton structure would look like. It, it, this, was, this is a real cytoskeleton structure, so individual cells here, and they have stained the cytoskeleton purple. 
so you can see what it would look like. It's a web of proteins that help to move things around the cell so that things aren't just freely floating and possibly getting where they belong, but that the cell can actually have control over where things move within it. So the cytoskeleton is made of three different types of fibers. Microtubules, which are hollow fibers that can grow and shrink to change the shape of the cell. That's these here. And microtubules also act as tracts to move organelles and form cilia and flagella, which cause cell movement. And microfilaments, which are thin fibers that maintain the cell's shape, and intermediate filaments, which anchor the organelles in place. So these work together. And if you look here at these pictures of cells, these cells have microtubules that are modified for movement. So we said that they move organelles within the cell, but they also are able to form cilia and flagella, which allow the cell to move through its environment. So the cell on the left here has short hair-like cilia around the outside, which are these little structures, and they wave and help the cell to move through the environment. And then this one on the right, has two long flagella, which are these long, they call them whip-like structures, and that can they can spin and move to help the cell navigate through its environment as well. So those are all formed from microtubules. So in summary, vacuoles store materials in a cell, lysosomes break down materials using enzymes. And the cell also has an internal cytoskeleton to provide support and movement. Okay, in this section we're talking about how cells get and use energy. And we're also going to talk about the boundaries of the cell. And these are the organelles that are responsible for these things. There are two organelles that maintain energy resources for the cell, chloroplasts and mitochondria. You know from unit one that they're, one of the characteristics of life is that organisms use energy. And so this energy has to come from somewhere, and there's two different organelles that do that, chloroplasts and mitochondria. Both of these organelles have double membranes. You can see an inner membrane and an outer membrane. Only plants and a few other organisms have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts contain stacks of flat disks that contain chlorophyll, which is the pigment that collects light. So you can see these stacks of disks within that chloroplast. So chlorophyll is the pigment responsible for capturing energy from sunlight and storing it as sugars in the cell. And this process is known as photosynthesis. We'll get into a lot more detail with photosynthesis later. But for now, you should know photosynthesis is the process of sunlight being converted into sugar, which is used for energy in the cell, and that the chloroplast is where that occurs. All eukaryotic cells, so that would be plants, animals, fungi, all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. Sometimes it's easy to think that plant cells have chloroplasts and animal cells have mitochondria, but plant cells have both. And the reason is because mitochondria convert food molecules into usable energy for the cell. The chloroplast does not do that. It just makes sugars, which are then used for energy, but the mitochondria are the ones that are responsible for breaking sugars down. And that process is known as cellular respiration. And again, we'll talk more about that later. The inner membrane of the mitochondria is folded, which provides a large surface area for molecules to be moved in and out. So things that have that are thinner have larger surface area. And so this is a thin 
stack here, but it is sort of wavy and so it's stacked upon itself. And so there's a lot more surface area here in this fold than there would be if it just was a straight membrane here. So lots of area here for molecules to be moving in and out. And we'll talk more about why that will be in future units. Okay, and then the cell has some boundaries as well. All cells have a flexible cell membrane, and we talked about that earlier. And the cell membrane regulates substances entering and leaving the cell. And the cell membrane is selectively permeable because it allows some molecules to cross, but not others. So it is selecting what it is allowing across. And sometimes we call, a we use other terms here. So the cell membrane is also called the plasma membrane sometimes. And we also say selectively permeable or semi-permeable. Those can be interchangeable terms. So there's the cell membrane on that picture. Plant cells, along with fungi and prokaryotes, also have more rigid cell walls that provide structure and support. So you can see on this picture, it has two layers here on this plant cell, a cell membrane, and then beyond the cell membrane outside of it is a cell wall. And the cell wall is the reason that a plant cell can swell with this vacuole, can swell with water, and become rigid. It actually pushes on this rigid cell wall and helps to uh, form a, a harder structure that helps the plant to stand upright. Animal cells don't have cell walls like that, so any water that they absorb is not going to change the structure of the cell. It's going to, um, we'll talk about this later in this unit, but it does actually can make the cell explode because it doesn't have anything to push against. The cell wall provides structure and support. So in summary, plant cells have specialized structures like chloroplasts and cell walls, but all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria to convert food into usable energy and cell membranes, which regulate materials coming in and out of the cell. Okay, so now that you know what the cell membrane is and where it's located, Let's talk about the structure of the cell membrane because it seems like it should just be um, an easy, simple barrier on this drawing. It's just a very simple line um, as we looked at in some other pictures, but it is far more complex than that. So cells need to move materials in and out of the cell. Food and nutrients need to come in, waste needs to leave, Gases are being exchanged, water is being exchanged all the time. And these substances can move through the cell membrane. As a reminder, the cell membrane surrounds the surface of the cell. All eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells have a cell membrane. So the cell membrane is comprised of two layers of phospholipids, which have two fatty acid chains and one phosphate group. So this is a very complicated explanation. We're going to go through what each of these terms means here in a second. But for now, you should know two layers, as you can see here. There's one layer here and one layer here. And they're made of phospholipids, which are these little um, ball-shaped structures with the two ends, two tails is what we call them. And so the cell membrane is also known as a phospholipid bilayer. So as you know here, as we're discussing roots, lipid means fat and bi means two. So this is a double layer of fatty acids. So the phosphate side of the phospholipid, which would be this circular part here in our very simplified drawing is known to be hydrophilic, which means water loving. Hydro meaning water, phyle 
meaning loving or liking, while the fatty acid side is hydrophobic, water fearing. So this is the fatty acid side, and you know what a phobia is, it means fear of something, so water fearing. And that would make sense to you because fats do not mix with water. So when you mix water and oil, it's going to separate. When you put a stick of butter in water, it is not going to mix together. So you know already that fats are hydrophobic. These fatty acid tails are act in a similar way. So the hydrophilic head is where the phosphate is found. And that's the hydrophilic part. And then the hydrophobic water fearing is the fatty acid tails. Other molecules are also found in the cell membrane. There are carbohydrates, which help to mark the cell, and you know that those are um, sometimes used for providing energy, but in this case, they also provide support. There are proteins, which are channels for large substances across the cell. There are many different functions of proteins in your body, but this is how they are used in the cell membrane. And cholesterol, which is another fat, and that helps to provide membrane stability. So in our picture of our bilayer here, we have these blue proteins or aqua proteins here. This one is a channel. This one is embedded and we'll talk more about why a cell would need that later. But these are proteins. These are carbohydrates and those are sugars there. And then there's also cholesterol, which is embedded in with the phospholipids and that helps to provide some structure for the cell membrane. So how does the structure of the cell membrane contribute to its function? So we've now learned about the different parts of its structure, but how, does, how do those different parts contribute to the function of the cell membrane, which is to provide a barrier for the cell and to allow materials in and out? So because the interior of the cell membrane is hydrophobic, some charged molecules will not pass through it. So if we go back here, this interior of the cell membrane here is hydrophobic. Remember these fatty acids do not want to be near water. So this is a hydrophobic portion of the cell membrane. And so some charged molecules are not gonna be able to pass through it. The carbohydrates and the proteins in the membrane regulate what can pass in and out of the cell. And these all together work together to form the membrane's selective permeability. So we have our carbohydrates here and these proteins which are integrated in to the cell membrane and they have receptors on them and they, those receptors detect what materials are trying to pass through the cell membrane and they can either allow some of those through or not. And there are some materials that are gonna be able to just pass directly through that cell membrane, but charged particles are not going to be able to. And so they need to use these channel proteins here. So all of these structures together help to determine what is moving in and out of those, the cell membrane, and that gives it its selective permeability properties. So how can substances move through the membrane then using these structures? There are two basic ways that substances move through the membrane. The first one is active transport, which requires energy, hence the name active. And examples of this are exocytosis, endocytosis, molecular transport, and bulk transport. And we'll talk about all of those a little bit more in depth. And then passive transport is the other way that substances move through the cell membrane to get into the cell or out of the cell. And passive transport does not require energy. So examples of this would be diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. And again, we'll talk about each of those. So in summary, the cell membrane is made of two layers of phospholipids, proteins, 
and other molecules that contribute to its selective permeability. Substances can pass across this membrane using passive or active transport. Okay, so I said we were going to look more closely at those different examples of passive and active transport. And the first one we're gonna start with is diffusion, which is a passive transport example, meaning that it does not require energy. And diffusion, by definition, is the random motion of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration, which is a lot of words, I know. But this is gonna make a lot of sense to you very quickly. Keep in mind, passive transport does not require energy. This is something that's going to happen naturally as molecules bump into each other. So here's an example of diffusion. When perfume is sprayed in one corner of a room, it is first noticed by students near that corner. Eventually, the whole room can smell the perfume because the molecules have moved from high concentration in the corner where it was sprayed to low concentration in other parts of the room. Same thing occurs in my house. If my daughter sprays perfume in her bedroom, that's going to be a high concentration. It's going to smell a lot in that bedroom, but eventually it may spread throughout the rest of the house as those molecules bump into each other and they start to spread more evenly throughout the house. And the same thing can happen here with ink molecules. You can see that as the ink is put into the glass of water, it's going to slowly spread out. And then as you might imagine, the rest of this glass will eventually turn into an even concentration of green ink. So you've seen this happen plenty of times in your life. It's just not something that you've put a name to before. Diffusion will continue until the molecules are equally spread out. This is called a state of equilibrium. So equilibrium just means the state at which the concentration of solute is the same throughout the solution. So solute is just going to be whatever is placed into a liquid is usually the easiest way to explain that. And so this is what this would look like here if we're talking about the cell membrane here. We've got the bilayer, which we talked about before. The cell membrane has two layers. These are our phospholipids all lined up here, facing inward. And if we have a concentration of some molecule, some solute on one side, this is the extracellular space, so this is outside of the cell membrane, and if we've got a high concentration here, they are going to pass through the cell membrane naturally and slowly, not using any of the cell's energy, and they're passing into the cell until eventually they are in equilibrium. So over time, substances are moving from a high concentration on one side to a lower concentration on the other side. They bounce into each other and spread out until the substance is equally spread, which means it's in equilibrium. Okay, facilitated diffusion is similar, hence the name. Um, facilitated means to help, so this is a diffusion process that's being helped along. And the facilitated diffusion process is passive transport as well, so no energy, but it is with the help of proteins. So remember we saw those proteins that looked like tubes in the cell membrane in the picture previously? Those are called channel proteins. So there's channel proteins that allow charged or larger molecules to flow through the membrane. Those that would not have been able to pass through with simple diffusion like these. So these orange particles are passing through with simple diffusion. And these particles here are going to pass through a channel protein. They are moving naturally but they can't pass through these phospholipids because of some sort of charge that they have um, or that they're too large and they can't fit between them. And then carrier proteins are the third or second example here of facilitated diffusion. And they help to actually change shape to carry the, the trans 
to transport the particles or molecules across the membrane. So these are just moving things from one side to the other as well. And again, all of these particles are moving from an area of higher concentration where there's a lot of them to an area of lower concentration. Osmosis is the simple diffusion of water through a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. So how is this different from the previous definition of diffusion? How do osmosis and diffusion differ? Diffusion is the movement of any type of molecule. We talked about solute, we talked about perfume, and osmosis is simply the diffusion of water. We only talk about water when we're talking about osmosis. And diffusion does not require a membrane when you're walking around your house and there's perfume moving from one area to another. It's not going through any membranes. It's just spreading out in the air of your house. Osmosis, on the other hand, not only is it the diffusion of water, but it also requires a membrane in between one side and the other. So here is a membrane example, and small molecules like these purple and green and yellow ones can pass through easily, but larger molecules cannot. So these are, this is a picture of um, red blood cells. And this is why the membrane is said to be semi-permeable or selectively permeable. And it's not just permeable to certain substances, but it is permeable to quite a few, just not all substances. So here is an example of what osmosis might actually look like. And you're going to see that in a lab as well. But in this diagram, the sugar that's on the right-hand side of this membrane, this semi-permeable membrane, is too big to pass through. But water, you know, is H2O, and sugar is a much larger molecule than water. And so water, because it's a small molecule, can pass through this semi-permeable membrane pretty easily. So the water is going to move towards the high solute concentration. So there's plenty of sugar over here, and the water is going to move to this side. It's going to be drawn to that high concentration. And it's going to equalize the solution a little bit better. So um, water is actually going to drop from this side and move to the other side, and you will see the water rise on this side. And they do that with a, um, an experiment called a U-tube um, because it's shaped like a U and with a membrane in the middle, and you can see molecules move from one side to the other. And a good way to remember this is solute sucks. So when you have solute like sugar in the water, it is going to draw the water from one side to the other. And so um, th this is osmosis occurring. Water is moving through a membrane from a high concentration of water over here to a lower concentration where it's mixed with sugar over here. So wherever there is more of a solute, the water will be sucked into the, that area. And that's not exactly what happens, but it's a good way to remember which way water moves. So the higher the concentration of a solute, like sugar or salt, um, that is where the water is going to move. It's going to get drawn into that area. So in a cell, channel proteins called aquaporins are going to move water across the cell membrane. Which image shows an aquaporin? So which is going to be a channel protein that's going to carry water across. And that is going to be the second picture here. This is the channel protein. And the reason that water can't travel across by itself in a cell membrane is not because it's large, but because it doesn't wanna pass through this hydrophobic area in the middle of the cell membrane. Water does not like to be here, so it's not going to naturally pass through here. It's gonna to need to go through a tunnel or a channel in order to get through there more easily. So in summary, diffusion 
facilitated diffusion, and osmosis are all types of passive transport. In all of these processes, substances move from areas of high concentration to low concentration, which does not require the use of energy. So no energy is passive transport and they are moving from high concentration to low concentration. Okay, so how does osmosis affect a cell? Why are we learning about things like diffusion and osmosis here in our cell unit? And it has to do with something called tonicity. Tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. So anytime we're talking about water movement, we're talking about osmosis. And we will discuss here three different types of solutions. Isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solutions. And all of those are different ways of explaining the tonicity of a cell. In other words, how does water move in that cell because of osmosis. So in an isotonic solution, iso, similar to equi, means equal. In an isotonic solution, the amount of solute is the same inside the cell as it is outside. So again, solute, we're referring to sugar, salt, nutrients, waste, whatever the um, item is that's dissolved in the external environment of the cell or internal environment of the cell. So these are just small molecules that we're talking about for the solute. So if the amount of solute is the same inside the cell and outside the cell, water is not going to be drawn either in or out and it is going to flow equally both in and out of the cell. So water here, you can see our arrows show that water is moving into the cell. This is our red blood cell and out of the cell equally. And that cell is going to stay the same size, whether it's an animal cell or a plant cell. And this is what the plant would look like if it was in an isotonic solution. You can see our cell wall around the outside here and water is moving into and out of that vacuole. So animal cells are stable in an isotonic solution. These red blood cells want to be in an isotonic solution. That's natural for them. Plant cells are going to survive in an isotonic solution, but they're not going to thrive because they want this vacuole to be as full of water as possible. Because as we, were, we talked about, remember, when that vacuole is full of water, it pushes on the cell wall and it helps the plant to stand upright. So they will survive in an isotonic solution, but they're not, that's not ideal for a plant. In a hypertonic environment, there is a higher amount of solute in the outside of the cell than there is in the inside. So the environment has a higher amount of solute than the cell does. And so if you put a red blood cell, a human red blood cell, into a hypertonic environment, water is gonna be drawn out of it. So that might be salt water or um, sugar, high sugar content, something like that. If there's a high amount of solute, it's going to draw water out of the cell. So water is going to flow out of the cell towards the environment because remember, solute sucks. So there's higher solute outside, it's going to suck out the water or draw the water out through osmosis. And so that's a bad situation for animal cells. Animal cells are going to shrivel and die in a hypertonic solution. And plant cells, their vacuole is going to shrivel up because it's not going to be filled with water. The water is being drawn out of it and the plant itself is going to shrivel and wilt. And this, in a plant cell, we call this plasmolysis, when the vacuole gets shrunken and water leaves the cell. And this can happen not only with sugar or salt solutes like we've talked about, but also with air. If there's not a lot of water outside of the plant, 
the water is going to be drawn outside of the plant because it's it wants to move from an area of high concentration where there's high water inside to where there's lower water outside. So it's being drawn out and that's what's gonna cause that plant to wilt. Uh, incidentally, the hyper, a good way to remember that, is that when someone is hyperactive, they have an above normal level of activity. Hypertonic means an above normal amount of solute outside of the cell. The opposite of hypertonic is hypotonic. And hypo, a good way to remember that, is low, hypo low. So in the environment of a hypotonic solution, the amount of solute is going to be lower outside the cell than there is inside the cell. And so that means that there's going to be more water actually on the outside of the cell because there's not very much solute concentration out there. And so it's going to be drawn into the cell. So water will flow into the cell where the concentration of solute is higher. If it's low outside, it's actually gonna have a slightly higher concentration of solute inside. And since solute sucks, what the water is gonna be drawn into the cell. An animal cell is flexible. It doesn't have a cell wall to protect it. And so when water is drawn into an animal cell, it is going to gain water and explode eventually if it keeps gaining water. It doesn't have a way to protect itself. Plant cell, on the other hand, has this rigid cell wall, and so it's not going to explode. And so plant cells actually thrive in a hypotonic solution because their vacuoles are pushing on that cell wall, and we call that pressure from the vacuole turgor pressure. So this is the situation that a plant would like to be in, plenty of water, and so that water is being drawn into the cells of that plant. So just as a quick review, if we look at our three types of solutions again, an isotonic solution, iso meaning equal, the amount of solute compared to the cell is going to be the same. They're gonna be equal. So that means that water will move equally in and out of the cell. That's the easy one. Hypertonic, hyper meaning more than, higher than, so outside of the cell is going to be a higher concentration of solute. So that is going to draw the water out of the cell into the environment. Hypo, the opposite, hypo means low. So the amount of solute outside of the cell is going to be low or less than inside of the cell. And that means that the solute concentration is actually going to be greater inside the cell. And so water is gonna be drawn into the cell in a hypotonic environment. So how can a cell use energy to move substances across the cell membrane? Active transport uses energy to move substances in or out of the cell. So, so far we've been talking about passive transport. We've been discussing diffusion and osmosis and facilitated diffusion, and those are all passive processes. They do not require energy from the cell. Active transport, on the other hand, does use energy to move substances in or out. And there are two major types we're going to talk about, protein pumps and bulk transport. Now, why would a cell want to use energy to move substances if it didn't have to? Well, it turns out that it does have to. Protein pumps allow substances to move from low concentration to high concentration, which is opposite the normal concentration gradient. So things normally, like perfume, would move from high to low concentration naturally. Protein pumps are going to force molecules to move in an opposite direction from low concentration to high concentration, and that's why it requires energy. So an example here is a pump that moves sodium and potassium to keep a steep imbalance in your nerve cells, and that allows the nerves to pass information. So they, the nerve cells need to have a high concentration of sodium outside the cell and a high concentration of potassium inside the cell the goal for the nerve cell is not to have both sides of this 
membrane balanced. So it is going to actively pump sodium out of the cell and actively pump potassium into the cell to keep that in balance. And that is what actually allows um, nerve impulses to pass along your nerves so that you can sense things. Bulk transport is another type of active transport. And this involves moving large molecules or clumps of large molecules in and out of the cell using two different methods. The first one being endocytosis, endo means into. So endocytosis uses vesicles, which are those bubble-like structures to move very large substances into the cell. So here's a picture. This is a vesicle, membrane bound bubble basically that stores items, molecules, and substances for the cell. And in endocytosis, the cell brings in very large substances and actually uh, a part of the membrane here actually bubbles in and um, is broken off to form that vesicle. So this is endocytosis and because it's so large, it requires energy to do that. And this would be, as I mentioned, the immune response cells um, engulfing bacteria from an infection or um, if you prick your finger and it's trying to remove bacteria or um, other foreign substances that have gotten into your body it does it through endocytosis exocytosis on the other hand exo meaning out uses vesicles to move very large substances out of the cell. So again, this is active because it's using very large substances. And so it requires a vesicle to push that out of the cell. And this would be large molecules of waste that the cell doesn't want, um, old pieces of organelles and things like that. Um, just things that the cell doesn't have a use for, can't be recycled and it's trying to pump it out. So those are both types of bulk transport which are both active, require energy. So just as a summary here, passive transport, I like to think of like rolling a ball down a hill because the movement is from high to low. So just when you roll a ball down a hill, it doesn't require energy to do that. And so passive transport, no energy. Active transport is the movement from low concentration to high concentration, which is like rolling a ball up a hill, which does require energy. So in summary, the solute concentration outside the cell can cause the cell to gain or lose water. Active transport allows substances to be pumped from low to high concentration or for large substances to be moved into or out of the cell, but it requires energy. So up to this point, we've been discussing really one cell at a time, but most organisms are not made of just one cell. So those would be called unicellular organisms that survive with only one cell. That would be like bacteria, and there are many, many different kinds of bacteria. Some algae, amoebas, which I showed a picture of early on in this unit, and yeast which is used to make bread and beer and things like that. And that is a single celled fungi. In a unicellular organism, a single cell is responsible for maintaining homeostasis. So homeostasis is the relatively constant internal conditions required for survival. So all through this unit, we've been talking about balance and how a cell can maintain balance of water, of solutes, of nutrients and waste, how does it maintain that balance through diffusion, osmosis, and active transport? And the goal of that is homeostasis, so that that cell can be in a constant condition so that it's not changing based on its environment, it's not having to change conditions and react every time that it moves to a different environment. When you go out into the rain, you don't want your cells to have to adjust. Um, so they are constantly working to maintain that internal balance. In a multicellular organism, as opposed to unicellular, 
many differentiated cells work together to maintain homeostasis. So this would be what happens in your body. All of your cells are working together to maintain a balance. So the balance of oxygen in your body, the balance of blood and water in your body, um, balance of hormones in your body are all caused by many cells working together because you are a multicellular organism. So how are cells arranged in multicellular organisms? They're not just all thrown together. They are specialized and work together based on a common function. So let's go through an example here. If you have a, a digestive cell, a stomach cell, let's say, in your body or in a mouse's body, it has a particular function, stomach cells secrete acid, they absorb food and nutrients. And so there are similar types of digestive cells in your stomach. And those cells work together to form a tissue, which is just a combination of cells working together for one function. Those tissues work together to form an organ. In here, we're talking about the stomach. So all of those digestive cells are going to band together and form the stomach. And that stomach is part of an organ system known as the digestive system. Again, it still has a common function. The digestive system's job is to absorb nutrients and excrete waste. And so all of those cells within the digestive system are working towards that purpose. And then you have several different types of systems that form the full organism, either you, the mouse, plant, any kind of multicellular organism that we're discussing is going to have different systems working for different functions. And they're all functioning together to keep homeostasis for that multicellular organism. So how do cells cooperate in a multicellular organism? If they have to work together, how is it that they are working together? For one, plant cells have openings in their cell walls that allow water and solutes to flow in between them. So we did talk about how cell walls are rigid and they protect the cell and they give the plant cell support, but they have openings in those plant cells that allow things to flow from one cell to the other. And that helps to keep the balance of water and solutes in the whole system rather than just in one individual cell. Similarly, animal cells have several types of cellular junctions that can either hold cells tightly together or pass molecules in between them. And so they are allowing things to pass between one animal from one animal cell to another and they also hold cells tightly together specialized receptors help to determine how each cell will act when something is passed to it so cells we're not going to get too much into how cells are specialized here but cells are specialized in your body you can't just take an eye cell from your body and put it in your stomach and it will function like a stomach cell. It just doesn't work like that. Um, they are specialized with certain jobs and they have structures that are made for those jobs. And they, each of those different specialized cells has a receptor, many receptors to determine how it's going to act when a molecule is passed to it. So an eye cell may function differently when it receptor notices a, a certain type of molecule um, and then a stomach cell may function differently if a receptor notices that same molecule because they are parts of different systems so because those cells are specialized they're not going to function in exactly the same way but they do function together and cooperate so in summary, although unicellular organisms work to maintain homeostasis in one cell, they're keeping a balance in just that one cell because that's all there is to that organism, multicellular organisms need many cells to communicate through tissues, organs, and organ systems. And they're using those junctions to communicate and pass molecules and water from one cell to another and one tissue to another.